morning I'm going to speak to you on what Christ was made for the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand together and the scriptures are all printed in your bulletin and we will read from John chapter 1 several portions of selected scriptures. It's in your bulletin and uh, it's in the beginning with John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was the light and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world needed him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. As many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God, even to them that he made him. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but of the or nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and was among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as the only of the Father, full of gracious truth. Thank you, be seated, please. The virgin birth of Christ. Many people do not believe it today, but we do. There are four ways in which people have come into this world of humanity. Four ways. First of all, by the special creative act of God. That's the case of Adam, who was created from the hand of God in the Garden of Eden, and he became a man. Genesis chapter 2 the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. The second way people have entered this world of humanity is by the man without the help of woman. This was the case of Eve who was made out of a rib taken from the side of Adam. Genesis 2.22 and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. So there are two people that have come into this world. Here's the third way. By man and woman. This is the natural means of childbirth as we've known it since the history of Adam. And the fourth is by woman without the help of man. This is the case of the birth of Christ. The unique case of Mary conceiving by the power of the Holy Spirit and bringing forth the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Although the virgin birth of Christ was a new thing under the sun, it was not new that God had given us a son. God has always had a son. In Psalms 2.12, David says, Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. God had a son before he was born. <clears throat> Excuse me. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The child is born, but the son is given. The early church believe without question the virgin birth of Christ. If you go back and study the early saints of God, you'll find that men like Irenaeus, Polycarp, <coughs> Tertullian, Origen, Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, and others stood out against the pagans of their day and affirmed the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he was born of a virgin. That he had no human earthly father. That God only 
was his father. I want to mention seven things that Jesus was made. In Galatians 4, 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son. You'll notice it was His Son before He came to earth. He sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. The biblical foundation for the virgin birth of Christ is laid deep in the Old Testament prophecies. For instance, in Genesis 3.15, we find God speaking to Satan. And God is talking to Satan, and He says, I, God, will put enmity between thee, that's Satan, and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. He, Jesus, shall bruise thy head, Satan's head, and thou, Satan, shall bruise his heel. On the cross, Jesus broke the power of Satan by crushing his head. The head speaks of power, but his heel was bruised in the process. Her seed refers to the seed of man, or the seed of the woman, rather. Mary is the only person who ever had seed. The seed comes from the man, but in this unique case, Mary's seed brought forth Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And thou, Satan, shall bruise his heel. And how he was bruised on the cross. He was bruised for our iniquities. On the cross, Satan applies a bruise to Christ, but only to his heel. And as Christ is dying on the cross, he crushes the head of Satan. Now the prophet Isaiah also prophesied the method. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin. Now, it's not a young woman. The modern translations have changed that word to a young woman. It's no miracle for a young woman to have a son. But it's a miracle when a virgin has a son. And we need to stay with the King James Version, which puts it in the correct word, virgin, not young woman. She was a young woman, but she was also a virgin young woman, which makes all the difference in the world. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And when Jesus came down and became one of us, He was God with us. He shall give you a sign. Jeremiah 31, 22. The Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. That is, a woman shall have within her womb a man-child. But the Father encompasses the germ of life. Here is a new thing. Something that has never been done before. Never had there ever been a case of a virgin giving birth to a son. But this is a new thing, Jeremiah says. A woman, unaided by a man, shall give birth to a man child. This is something new. Now in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, the angel came to Joseph. Then we're going to see that he also came to Mary. And this is what he said to Joseph. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. 
the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The word Jesus means Savior. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, speaking of Isaiah, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Then that angel comes to Mary. He's already prepared Joseph now. Now he will come to prepare Mary, to speak to her. And the angel said unto her, Luke 1.30, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's why we're premillennial. Because he shall reign over the house of Jacob, that's Israel, forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Jesus is coming back to earth. He's going to reign over Israel and his people. And he will reign for a thousand years and then on out into eternity. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit, who was present in creation, who garnished the heavens with its beauty, the Holy Spirit, who is the omnipotent power of Almighty God, He worked a miracle and caused Mary to conceive and bear a son. And so the doctrine of the virgin birth is laid deep in the foundation of the Old Testament. Then as we come to the New Testament, we find angels confirming this to Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and others. Now let us consider the consequences of denying the virgin birth of Christ. If you deny the virgin birth of Christ, you paralyze the whole scheme of redemption in Christ. Mark it well. If he had a human father, and as that father had a finite personality, then he inherited a finite personality. If he had a finite personality, of course we are bound to say he did not have an infinite personality. He was not then an infinite person. If he were not infinite, he was not God. If he was not God, then he was not the second person of the eternal trinity. If he was not the second person of the trinity, then none ever was. If none were, there is no triunity of God. If there be no triunity of Godhead, we are landed at the front door of Unitarianism. That bloodless, emotionless, soulless system which substitutes intellect for spirit, reason for faith, and praying about God and knowing Him not. Deny the virgin birth, and as absolutely as two and two make four, as inexorably as an arrow finds its mark, you deny and reject the Trinity of God. Without the virgin birth, Christianity has no authority. Neither is an ethical or a doctrinal system. Without the virgin birth, I repeat, 
Christianity has no decent moral, spiritual, or intellectual basis on which to stand. He who smites the virgin birth denies Bible Christianity. He smites the mother of our Lord with shame, snatching the crown of deity from his brow, stripping him of his sinless humanity, and makes his cross a blood-stained failure, and bids us face eternity with no light in the darkness. Well, you say, don't all Christians believe in the virgin birth of Christ? Well, yes, they do, because if they don't believe, they're not Christians. But they did some statistical work. The publishers of Red Book, which is a very popular magazine for many years, employed pollsters to investigate the doctrinal beliefs of students in Protestant seminaries. They wanted to know how many of these future preachers believed in the virgin birth of Christ. And they found that 56% did not believe in the virgin birth of Christ. What does this mean? It means 56% of these men being trained for the ministries are going to go out into churches and deny the virgin birth of Christ and deny the very trinity of God and deny the very living God himself. And this has been going on for a number of years and it's increasing all the time. Hence, we need to preach on the virgin birth of Christ and assure people that Christ was born of a virgin and show the disastrous consequences if he were not. There was a survey research center in the University of California at Berkeley. That's a highly respected college, although it's a hotbed of unbelief. And they decided to poll all the denominations and see how they stood on the virgin birth of Christ. They found that among the congregational churches, 21% believed in the virgin birth of Christ. That means 79% of them are all unsaved. The Methodists, only 34% believed in the virgin birth of Christ. The Episcopalians, 39% believed in the virgin birth of Christ. The United Presbyterians did a little better. 57% of them believed in the virgin birth of Christ. The Lutherans did a little better than that. 66% of them believed in the virgin birth of Christ. And the churches of the American Baptists, that's the Northern Baptists, 69% believed in the virgin birth. The Missouri Synod of Lutheranism, 92% believed in the virgin birth of Christ. And the Southern Baptists, 99% believed in the virgin birth of Christ. Of the Roman Catholics poll, 19% rejected the virgin birth of Christ. Do you see the problem today that we have in the ministry? A denial of the Trinitarian God a denial of the living God, a denial of the virgin birth, destroys Christianity. Christianity has a foundation on which it stands. It stands on the foundation of the virgin birth of Christ. It stands on the foundation of His atoning blood shed on the cross of Calvary. It stands on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. And you take away these three great cardinal doctrines, and you don't have anything but a, a moral, or an immoral rather, social club. But Christianity is real. It's genuine. It can take a sinner like me, and a sinner like you, and take him out of his sins, and give him eternal life, and a 
assure him of a home in heaven. That's how important the virgin birth of Christ is. <clears throat> Seven years ago, a pastor by the name of Dr. Roland Lavelle was called to a church in one of our southern cities. He had only been there a few weeks when he was accosted in the heart of the city by a very cynical physician, a medical doctor, who was known to be an atheist. And he cornered the young pastor and he said, Parson, some time ago, a young woman about 22 years old came to our hospital and gave birth to a baby boy. She told us the boy had no father. I want to know if you would have believed her story. Now he was trying to lay a trap for the pastor. The pastor turned the tables on him by saying, Doctor, if that woman's son had been born in answer to the prophets for 1,500 years, if when he was born the angels of heaven sung praises to God for the wondrous event, if he had lived in a morally and spiritually bankrupt world and his very enemies could not convict him of a single sin, if wherever he went he opened blind eyes, cleansed the lepers, raised the dead, cast out demons, if he spoke words of truth and wisdom such as the world had never known, if evil men had taken him outside the city and nailed him to a cross, and the noonday sun hid its face in shame for the terrible deed, if they had buried him and put a platoon of soldiers to watch his grave, lest he come forth from the grave, and yet on the third day he had come forth and had appeared for forty days with many infallible proofs of his resurrection from the dead. If he had ascended to heaven from the highest mountain in the area in sight of everybody at noonday, if for 1,900 years his very name and message had blessed the world with such mighty blessings as Christianity has given to the world, if his ministry had built orphanages and hospitals and asylums and churches and Christian homes through all of these years, if I had needed a Savior and I had cast myself upon His mercy and He had done as much for me as one has done whom I trusted, who was born of a virgin without a human father, if all this had been true of Him, oh yes, Doctor, I would have believed that woman's story. I believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the greatest light that ever shined. He is the greatest voice that ever spoke. He's the greatest teacher that ever taught. He's the greatest man that ever lived. He's the greatest sufferer who ever suffered. But about this Jesus, the Bible has three significant words which cry for attention. Those three words are, He was made. He was made. Three words sounding forth like a great organ. Three words like gleaming jewels flashing in the sunlight. Three words demanding attention. Three words that bloom like flowers. He was made. And I want to speak this morning on what he was made. First, he was made a woman. There was a Greek philosopher by the name of Plato. He was a lover of words. I have an affinity with anybody that likes words. I love words. A student asked him one time, Plato, is there a God? 
And this great Greek philosopher, blind to the truth, got a little glimpse of truth when he said, I don't know. But if there is a God, He will one day reveal Himself to mankind and He will do it through a word. And I turn in my Bible to John 1, 1 to see if I can find that word by which He would reveal Himself. And I read in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. That's Christ. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Jesus is God. Verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There's this little phrase, He was made. We want to know this morning, what was He made? There were seven things that He was made. First of all, He was made flesh. After being made of a woman. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was made flesh. Colossians 1.16 speaks of this pre-existent Christ. Or by Him, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Thirdly, he was made under the law. Galatians 4, 4. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now the law is epitomized in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not worship any graven image. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not covet. That's the law of Almighty God. That law has never been rescinded. The ceremonial law has been rescinded. The civil law has been rescinded, but the moral law of God stands today. And by that law, God will judge men in the last day. They've broken the law, and they must face the consequences of a broken law. And who among us has not broken that law? At least some of them. And James says if you break one, You're guilty of all. So if you've ever broken one law, ever told one lie, ever took anything that didn't belong to you, then you've broken all ten of the the commandments because they're a unit. You break one, you break all. So what does that make you? Have you ever lied? You say, I surely have. Then that makes you a liar. Have you ever stolen anything that didn't belong to you? You say, yes, I have. That makes you a thief. So before I go any further with it, I can say this morning, before you were saved, you were a lying, thieving adulterer. Oh, you say, preacher, I wasn't that bad. Oh, yes, you were. In God's sight, you broke His law, all ten of the commandments. And that's why on the day of Pentecost, those convicted men who crucified Christ cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They realized they were under condemnation. What can we do? And there's nothing they could do except repent 
and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is a gift of God. So he was made under the law. To go to heaven, I must have a perfect righteousness. Having never broken the law. That would shut me out. It would shut you out. Where would I find a righteousness that would get me into heaven? I have to have a 100% perfect righteousness. And I don't have it. At least I didn't for many years. But Jesus was made, it says here, under the law. He came to fulfill the law. He said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And as He walked on this earth for 33 and a half years, as a righteous man, He could say to those Jews, Which of you convinceth me of sin? Nobody took the challenge. And as He walked, day after day, he was performing a work of perfect righteousness. And that perfect righteousness is to be imputed or charged to the account of all his elect. All those that he chose before the foundation of the world, he will impute that perfect righteousness of Christ to their account. I was thinking in my study this week about a credit card. I have a credit card that doesn't have any limit on it. I have a credit card that's good at any bank. I have a credit card in my name. And I thought to myself, I'm going to heaven on Jesus' credit card. Are you following me? On His perfect righteousness, when I stand at the heaven's gate, I'll pull out Romans 5.10. Here's Jesus' credit card. Is it acceptable here? Why, of course, come on in. I'm going to heaven on Jesus' credit card. I had no credit. I had no merit. But His perfect credit, His perfect righteousness is credited to my account. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. You read the fourth chapter of the book of Romans. When you go home, sit down and read the fourth chapter and part of the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. And then read Romans 5.10. We are redeemed reconciled by the death of His Son. To make that credit card good in my name, He had to die for me to pay the penalty to make that card good. And I expect to enter heaven on Jesus' righteousness because I had none of my own. If I had to be 100% perfectly righteous, I would go to hell. But I stand right now in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's mine. One night, 60 years ago, I received that credit card. I received that righteousness, which is by faith. And for 60 years, I've lived on His credit card. When I, when I need grace, I pull out His credit card. And read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. That's a gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. And when I'm in fear, I pull out his credit card where he says 365 times in the Bible, Fear not, for I am with thee. And whatever I need in this life, I go to Jesus' credit card and I draw from Him what I need. And He never lets me down. He never lets me down. No matter what I ask Him for, He never lets me down. I'm going to heaven on Jesus' credit. 
Are you? Are you? He magnified the law. He kept the law. And he bare the penalty of that broken law for us. He clothed himself with our dust that we might wear his livery in heaven. He lay in the grave that we might sit on the throne with him. He emptied himself of the glory that he had before with the Father that we might share in his glory. And then fourthly, he was made a curse. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. You see, if a man hangs on a tree, according to Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 23, he's under the curse of God. Why did Jesus hang on a tree? Peter says they slew him on a tree. Why? Because he was bearing the curse of God that we deserve. And he took it in our place. And Deuteronomy 21-23 records, If a man hath committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree. Thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is a curse of God. He that is hanged on a tree is a curse of God. He was bearing our curse, taking our place, dying under God's punishment that we deserve. Made a curse for us. And then fifthly, he was made sin. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. And John says, which of you convinces me of sin? Judas said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Made sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, in Him is full righteousness. And if you're in Him, you have it. If you're not in Him, you don't have it. Made sin means God dealt with Him as He must deal with sin. He stood before God with all our sin upon Him. He drank the cup dry. The manger and the cross are inseparable. That's why I preach on the virgin birth of Christ and the cross of Calvary. He was made flesh that he might be made sin. That night, when in the Judean skies the mystic star dispensed its light, a blind man moved in his sleep and dreamed that he had sight. That night, when the shepherds heard the song, a host angelic choiring near, a deaf man stirred in slumber spell and dreamed that he could hear. That night, when in the cattle stall slept child and mother cheek by Joel, a cripple turned his twisted limbs and dreamed that he was whole. That night, when o'er the newborn babe the tender Mary rose to lean, a loathsome leper smiled in sleep and dreamed that he was clean. That night, when to the mother's breast the little king was held secure, a harlot slept a happy sleep and dreamed that she was pure. That night, when in the manger lay the sanctified who came to save. A man moved in the sleep of death and dreamed there was no grave. I have a last 
point or two. He was made alive. To whom? Acts 1 3. Also, he showed himself alive after his passion, that is, his death, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Revelation 1 18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. A huge chasm had developed on the morning of the resurrection because the disciples had gathered together in an upper room. Their throne of their beloved had disappeared to a tomb. His kingdom had shrunk to the narrow dimensions of a grave. His only scepter was a weed with which they smote him on the head. His only crown was a crown of thorns. His only inaugural speech was a lonely cry. His only coronation companions were two thieves. But something happened. From the mouth of the Roman centurion who stood guard at the tomb, he related when he went home to his wife what had happened that early morning when Christ rose from the grave. And he put it in the form of a poem. He said to her, This morning it was, just ere dawn, the heavens parted wide. The whole earth shook with palsy tongue. Our grief could not be cried. And when at last we raised our heads, the stone was rolled aside. The angel sat thereon, the glory of his countenance, like lightning shot the dawn. We pierced the tomb with streaming eyes and saw his body gone. He was made alive. My last point, he was made Lord. Acts 2.36 Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. Philippians 2, 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Have you done so? If not, will you do so? It may be you're here this morning without a church home. Would you come and become a part of Trinity Baptist Church? It may be here that you're here this morning and you've never received this wonderful Christ into your life. He stands at the door of your heart right now. Throw open the door. Ask Him to come in and He will come in. Let us stand together, please. As we sing together, you'd like to come into the watch care of the church, the fellowship of the church. If you'd like to come and make your confession of faith that you have become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we sing, just as I am, who will come this morning? Just as.
Spirit of the Church. This is where the water of the good thing is, the peace, the comfort, the 